From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, I'm Paige St. John, and this is Episode 7 of Man in the Window. In this special update episode, I'll explore the language of rape and why, going back decades, the police, the media, and even victims and their families struggle to talk about what happened to them. It's a good time to stop and talk about how Man in the Window came together, about why so many women who would never dream of going public about the rapes are now speaking out. And also, I'd like to catch listeners up on the criminal case pending against Joseph D'Angelo and the continuing police investigation into the Golden State killer murders and rapes. As always, you'll hear new material and details never before reported in this highly publicized case. I'll also be sharing some audio that didn't make it into the series, but that illuminates the challenges around these issues. To do that, I'll be speaking with Laura Beale. She's the host of Wondery's Dr. Death, an investigation into the negligence that kept a dangerously inept surgeon in the operating room, even after killing and maiming patients. Man in the Window is pleased to have Simply Safe as its presenting sponsor. Simply Safe believes fear has no place in a place like home. So they made an incredibly smart security system that protects every point of access to your home doors, windows, garage, you name it. They do all the worrying so you don't have to. Simply Safe is a night watch for your home, it's a day watch too. This is whole home protection, from burglars, of course, but also fires, water damage, medical emergencies, and more. Everything is monitored 24-7 by professionals ready to dispatch police. Simply Safe's 24-7 monitoring is just $14.99 a month, and they'll never lock you in a long-term contract. So go with the only home security I trust, Simply Safe, by going to simplysafe.com window. Go today and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash window for the only home security I trust. Simplysafe.com slash window. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, I'm Paige St. John, and this is Man in the Window. This is Episode 7, The Language of Rape. Laura, thank you for talking with me, and thanks for your work on medical negligence. I'm glad to be here. This is an important conversation to have. You know, this series is about so much more than Joseph D'Angelo and this gruesome tale of the Golden State Killer. For me as a listener, the real shock was how rape was viewed in the 70s and 80s. I mean, I got the sense that it was barely a crime, which to me was jaw-dropping. You know, I had the same reaction in that case when I began reporting. The the original assignment was to look into Joseph D'Angelo and profile him, describe for people who he was. And very quickly, I came to understand that there was so little information really available that even the predator in these crimes is never more than a silhouette in the window for the victims. I was astounded by the material I was coming across about rape at the time, the experiences of the women who were raped, and what they were up against, not just in the police reports and the original reports of how their crimes were treated, but how the media handled them, how um, television at the time created a hysteria over this case, but gave no attention at all to the trauma and the pain that the victims themselves went through. So, Early on, kitchen table discussions with my husband, this is where the concept of man in the window, you know, developed, that you have a figment of of a predator, and the focus really is on the women, that this is a women's story to be told. Yeah, I mean, it's really a story about how a whole generation of women were silenced and how the rise of the women's movement helped all of us as a whole, but these women were still left behind. I was just wondering if that 
distance between the battles of the 70s and today created a problem. It created a big problem in the storytelling because I found, as I spoke to editors about the project or other people about it, that they could not really understand or grasp how things could be that way in the 70s, how we could not even consider in California rape as a, a bodily harm, that that property crimes had tougher sentences and penalties. And it was very difficult for even my daughter, who's 23, to understand how a woman would be treated in 1976. So as a reporting project, then, it became very important to put people back into that place. I mean, in print, we could show pictures of of cops and bell-bottoms, some pretty surreal images from the 70s. But in sound, that required, you know, hearing how people talked about rape at the time and, and the tenor of the voices, the softness of women. Women spoke in a higher pitch at that time. And and we're talking about the time at the rise of the Equal Rights Amendment, a lot of very divisive rhetoric circulating, you know, in, in popular culture at the time about women and women's lib and whether it was an anti-male movement. Yeah, you mentioned your daughter who's 23. I have a daughter who's 18. And it would be unfathomable to her that rape was thought about in this way in in the 70s, which I think really speaks to how far we've come, but also what these women had to go through, that, that, that what they had to go through is just completely unbelievable to a whole generation of young women today. And these women are still around us. The, this is, I remember... Exactly. Looking at my husband and saying, "This is these are our mothers. These women have not gone away. Their their stories are still there. Their trauma is still there. They've never had a chance at counseling or someone to even listen to what they went through." Which actually brings up another point that I was wondering about is you do have to talk to these women very intimately about what happened to them and how do you delve into such an awful subject as rape without also exploiting the pain of these women? I'm just wondering how you went into that territory. It took a lot of time. That's the easy answer. Um, you know, in all of these cases, I've been working with these women for a year now. Our initial conversations were at a much kind of more superficial level. And I stressed that it was important to get to know them first. I wanted to make sure that they understood that it's my intent to show that this does not define who they are and that I'm interested in who they are as people and that they're not cardboard silhouettes. They're not like frozen in time because um, the arrest of Joseph D'Angelo in their case was very traumatic for these women. It resurfaced all the, the trauma of the attacks, and for them it was like the, the morning after, immediately. The panic attacks, the nightmares uh, were, you know, back upon them. You know, that's interesting because we would expect that these women, upon hearing that there's an arrest, would think, oh, with it, you know, now there's justice, there's closure, there's all of these things that we on the outside think that they would feel, but you're saying that's not, that's not what happened to them. Exactly the opposite. It uh, That Hollywood moment, you know, escapes them. And in fact, for them, the nightmare now just has been resurrected. It's it's actually the title of our sixth episode because it deals with that. It's like the monster's been dug back up from the grave. The nice thing is that now there's counseling available. They can go into therapy. And I worked pretty hard with having them check in with their therapists and counselors about talking to me, uh, looking for the red flags of, you know, when it gets too traumatic, we'll stop. If there's something you don't want to talk about, we won't go there. I gave them control over the interviews and control over what I would use from those interviews. And that was emphasized to me by one of our other reporters at the newspaper. She volunteers on a rape crisis line. And she said she's learned that it's very important that you give victims of sexual assault control over their story because the thing taken away from them in a rape is that control. What do you hope comes out of this project and and telling of this story? If you'd asked me that question at the beginning of the project, I don't think I would have had an answer. 
normally when I'm doing an investigative project, you know, I'm trying to right or wrong. There's no way I'm going to fix what happened in the 70s, you know, go back in time and, and, and change law. By the end of it, I began to realize that what I'm really trying to do is create a place where conversations can be had, not just the women who are, were interviewing in this project, but the women who are listening to the project and the men who are listening to the podcast, that they can turn to their mothers, wives, daughters, sons, husbands, and talk about this. Um, sexual assaults have happened to so many people, and they've not had that space to do this, and I'm hoping that this does launch you know, some conversations. When we talk about conversations, too, there is a request, a special request that had been made to me by one of the women who was raped, Chris. And that was that in exchange for her talking with me and telling me things that she had not even told other members of her family, that I begin to have a conversation with my mother, who I had told Chris early on in this project. My mother was raped in the 70s. You know, I was her daughter. Uh, saw how she was treated by her parents, saw the stigma she went through, saw the difficulties she had when she, you know, filed criminal charges and took that case to court. And and my mother now is 87, and Chris has said, you need to talk with her. And so we're having those conversations privately, but I have to say, how do you even approach a woman who's 87 to begin the conversation of rape? And <laughs> what if you could uh, take us through that thought? I mean, how how do you and and knowing too, given as you said earlier, these women are still alive and still out there. I mean, how how do you approach a woman today who's in her seventies and eighties might have had this terrible experience that they haven't talked about? How do we even start those conversations? with the women around us? It's a really, really good question. I'm I'm learning that I need to listen, and she may not be ready herself to talk, but I'm leaving that door open that I'm ready to listen if she does. But I want to add that she doesn't hide the fact that she was raped. She's comfortable letting me tell the world that it happened, and until I did this podcast, I never heard her talk about how it made her feel. And, you know, how it broke up our family. She got a divorce, her parents, uh, the way they treated her, and how she was changed in the world. And and so those are the things now I'm listening for. And I guess that's the most important thing we can do, right, is ask and listen and try to at least let these women know that uh, we are here to to hear them. Exactly. I think I th I think so. In in this developing and unfolding conversation, it comes at you from surprising places. I had other people come forward during this project to say me too. Bonnie, who was the fiance of Joseph D'Angelo, who's she's the woman this story in many ways starts with chronologically who feels it's very important that other women, especially the women who are raped by the East Area rapist know that she herself was raped later in life and went through the same things and finally came to a place, you know, dealing with rape crisis counselors and, and seeking support to understand that it did not define her. I have a counselor. I have gone through all of this. Uh, yeah, I'm supports. not doing things on my own anymore. <laughs> well, she wrote me recently about discussing her rape, about why she wants to do it. She said... It gives her a little bit of extra understanding for the victims that she's walked in their shoes, lost her clothes to the investigation, been through a rape exam. Uh, in her words, a sisterhood I never thought I'd join. And she added a note about telling her story that she thinks that, it, it, that any help for others that comes out of it is a bonus. Bonnie's rape took place in 2005. She was attacked, raped, and beaten by a stranger while she was in Rome, uh, coming back to her apartment from a soccer match. She had no idea where to go. She was unable to speak enough Italian to ask for help, and she wound up having to ride public buses to get to a hospital. Uh, this attack occurred during a national medical strike, so then she also find herself sitting in this large um, waiting room at the emergency ward among like 100 or 200 other, other people waiting to be seen. After about a half an hour, it, I just 
let it go. I just, I started crying. And a little teeny Italian grandma came over to me and put her arm around me and started asking me. You know, I, just, I just fell apart crying. I, that was it. I'd held it together up until then. And, and now I was hitting this brick wall. She had broken ribs, a busted face, large hunks of her hair were ripped out, and she reported her attack to police in Rome, and they never found her attacker. You're married at the time. Yes. And you didn't phone and tell your husband. No. You waited until you came back to the States. Yes. I could only imagine that he would be obligated or feel obligated to put his pencil down go buy whatever ticket he could purchase to come and get me and bring me home. Mm -hmm. And I just decided I'm not, I'm not doing that. So before listeners react to that and put themselves in Bonnie's shoes, I want them to know that this is not the first time I've heard this kind of reaction. One of the women who was attacked by the East Area Rapist, Linda Odell, told me that she refused to call her father when she was raped. She didn't want him Uh, coming out to California and dragging her back home and taking over her life. And I find that loss of control of your life is a big issue for rape victims. Studies show that security systems deter burglars, but there's still a burglary every eight seconds in America. That's because burglars don't give up just because some houses have security systems. They just find a house that isn't protected. That's why securing your home is truly a necessity. And there's no better way to secure your home than with our sponsor, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is reliable home security that's not only easy to set up, I had mine up and running in about an hour. It's affordable too. Their 24-7 professional monitoring and police dispatch is just $14.99 a month. That's every room, window, and door in your house, covered for only $14.99 per month. And they'll never lock you in a long-term contract. More than 3 million people already know it feels good to fear less with Simply Safe. So go with the only home security I trust, Simply Safe, by going to simplysafe.com slash window. Go today and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash window for the only home security I trust. simplysafe.com slash window. Summer is upon us, which means you get to wear shoes that are a little more fun and a little easier to toss on. Flats, heels, loafers. Ah, the simplicity. The problem is... Wearing shoes without socks leads to sweaty, sticky, smelly, and blistered feet. You can try no-show socks, but let's be honest, those usually show. But Gex has solved all of these problems once and for all. Gex are the only no-show sock that actually stick inside your shoe. That way you can keep your no-sock style but stay comfortable and stench-free. The adjustment placement of Gex guarantees comfort and a true no-show look. The adjustable placement of Gex guarantees comfort and a true no-show look. And antimicrobial yarns destroy odor-causing bacteria before it can start. It's basically a sock that cleans itself. (laughs) How great is that? Take a few minutes to put them in and you'll happily forget about swamp foot all summer. Gex are available for men and women in many shoe styles, including flats, heels, sneakers, and loafers. Visit mygex.com, that's M-Y-G-E-K-K-S dot com, for 20% off your first order using the code WINDOW. That's mygex.com code WINDOW for 20% off your first order. The series is very explicit with the language that's used and and the language of rape and how we talk about it. How did you make the decision about the language and, and why was that so important? This part of the case was one of the things that jumped out at me when I'm, if people asked me if I was surprised by anything that I encountered as I did this reporting And it was the number of times that in a police report about an East Area Rapist attack, I would find the word gentle 
We're talking about a man who held a gun at people's heads or a knife to their throat, who sexually assaulted women eight times, sodomized them, forced masturbation, rape, you know, and just incredibly gruesome attacks or brutal attacks, terrorizing them. And yet police use the word gentle. And so I became aware that— Gentle? Are you saying I'm having trouble understanding you and maybe I'm not believing? You're saying gentle? Gentle, G-E-N-T-L-E. Oh, my gosh. Exactly. And and so the language of rape became a very central focus for me. It, I, And I went to the detectives who handled the case at the time, including Carol Daly, who's a female detective. She's the woman who took the narratives from most of the female victims who'd been raped and asked, what does this mean? What what are these officers referring to? And it even shows up in a psychological profile in which the psychiatrists are warning that he wants to kill, yet they're still calling him gentlemanly. So I'm I'm still trying to imagine any scenario in which you could use the word gentle in describing this attacker. Exactly. And I can't. And and so Carol's response to me was that we don't have a language for rape. We talk about it so little, and even today, that we lack the words. And and so and they didn't say in the newspapers, they never said at the time how many times these women were sexually assaulted. They never used the word sodomy. They never used the word masturbation. They never spoke about what actually happened in those bedrooms and living rooms to these women. So you could get away with that kind of thing. And I'm surprised they didn't call him the gentle rapist. I feel this point could use some elaboration. So news reporters at the time are obviously struggling with how to talk about rape, how to describe what is actually happening in the attacks, and what really constitutes harm. Detectives say the victim was not physically harmed other than the rape itself. One case we had in Sacramento uh, uh, a year over a year ago, Uh, The woman grabbed his gun and started to wrestle with him, and he hit her. And in the Davis case, my understanding is that that woman resisted a great deal, and, of course, uh, he did beat her. But those those are the only two cases where he has uh, uh, physically harmed uh, the victims outside of the uh, sexual assaults themselves. You have to make a decision. Do you want, would you rather be uh, dead than raped, you know? The word gentle actually appears in four of the rape reports written by officers at the time. The 24th, the 26th the 36th and the 47th rapes. And in all of those cases, the victim's husband or their boyfriend was also in the house. He was bound up and threatened with rape or the death of their children. And in almost all of those cases, too, the rapist was sobbing. One woman told the police he cried, I'm sorry, Mommy. Mommy, please help me. But he sodomized and raped those women repeatedly. Even before these rapes, earlier in the series, psychiatrists for the state from the California Youth Authority and the State Department of uh, Corrections were telling detectives in Sacramento that this rapist is what they called gentlemanly. In the very same report, these same psychiatrists note just one page later that he has a, quote, strong urge to kill. So Detective Richard Shelby, who was one of the original detectives on the case, just rejects that notion out of hand. What would that have meant at that time, you know, to have... Law enforcement calling a rapist gentleman. I never heard anybody calling that. The people involved, in, the person profiles I have no use for. Like I think I said before, it's entertaining. But I never heard any cop working the case call him gentleman. They might have said, well, he didn't hurt anybody. Well, that's crap, too. Forget the emotional pain. Everyone had a little pain. Like one of them, he squeezed his thumb real hard for some reason until she cried out. One, he held a knife or ice pick or something next to her eye and left a little hole there. There are fine little marks in all of them, and some of them didn't even know they were there until the investigators said, you know, you've been cut here or something. This guy really wanted to hurt these people bad. And Detective Carol Daly, who's the woman who did most of the interviews of the raped victims, has a similar point of view. You said it was um, the most horrific rapes that you had seen. As rapes go, were they different or more horrific than in other rapes? It it was the um, amount of time that the rapist spent in the home. Uh-huh. Okay, on, on your typical rape, mm-hmm. the rapist will go in, subdue the victim, 
uh, the rape act will occur and then he's out like a flash. And um, with this rapist, he remained in the house two or three hours. Um, he wandered in and out, making threats, stabbing, you know, uh, in the pillow next to the victim's face, um, oh, really? thre making threats to kill. And so about the time that they would think that he was gone, it was like he was standing there watching him. And they would start to move, and he said, I'm going yeah, to kill you. Yeah, Paul called him a psychological sadist. Yes. the frame he used. Yes. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And um, so they, they had so much fear for their lives. But can you, I mean, I, as, as reporters and, and who, who report these things, I mean, you do wonder in media reports how explicit to be because in, in other areas of medicine, I have to be very careful when I'm talking about certain conditions. For example, uh, eating disorders. It's, it's very critical to leave off certain details. So if someone who is experiencing that or relapsing it doesn't, uh, get triggered by it. Is it is it the same when you're talking about a crime like rape that you have to walk this line between being explicit and telling it exactly like it is and conveying the violence that happened, but also being sensitive to somebody out there who might be in a vulnerable place? I think that even talking about the topic in general is a trigger for for victims of sexual assault. This is a very difficult issue to even hear about. And and we've got disclaimers and warnings at the tops of, of the episodes about what we're dealing with so that they know going into this. Um, to, to talk frankly about what happened to the women, I've, I try to walk a, a very fine line. I definitely stay away from anything I think is voyeuristic that in any way exploits or, or touts this, to, to making sure, though, that people understand the horror and brutality of what the women endured. And so that is my guiding light on what language to use, how much to say, and what to leave out. Launching a podcast like this while the case is still unresolved presents uh, its own set of issues. Um, so it's been, as I understand it, he was arrested a year ago. Uh, what's happened in the case since then? So Joseph D'Angelo has not yet had a chance to enter a plea. There's not been a single evidentiary hearing in the case. No presentation of what kind of evidence is against him or the quality of the DNA that uh, was used for the basis of the arrest. Uh, we're still in the phase of negotiations between district attorneys from multiple counties and the public defender over where they're going to proceed, how they're going to proceed, should cameras be allowed in the courtroom, how much you know publicity are they going to allow to the case before they, they declare that he can't have a, a fair trial. Victims at this point are told could be four to five years away. For them, unfortunately, they have very little information about what's happening and um, and being in the dark has created its own problems. People like Phyllis, who has an understanding she will be expected to take the stand and testify and have to look at Joseph D'Angelo during that testimony and be cross-examined by his attorney, and that terrifies her. You'll hear in, and I'll play a little bit of um, sound that I recorded outside of the courthouse in one of these as I follow Phyllis in, it's created a point that, that the women who were raped have difficulty even getting into the uh, courtroom. They, they are ushered in through and ha they have to pass in front of a long hallway of cameras focused on them and filming their every move. And they really feel like they're under the microscope and they're being examined. And um, it's forced some into hiding. Uh, Bonnie uh, had to, like hide and couldn't return to her home. There were so many satellite TV trucks crowding, you know, her driveway and her daughter's house and her brother's house. And now the political campaigning has started on top of that. It's kind of mimicking what happened in the 1980s when the hysteria over the East Area Rapist was a springboard for, you know, the governor's campaign, the attorney general's race for tough on crime politics. So now this case is being used 
uh, for the political battles in California on the death penalty. However, there are certain crimes that are so brutal, so awful, involve so many people and have so many victims. That is why we have the death penalty. Unfortunately, now our governor has decided to interpose his own personal opinion regarding the death penalty. The man speaking in that clip you just heard is the brother of one of the murder victims. In a press conference staged right outside the door to the courtroom, even as the women who were raped and the family members of other murder victims are trying to squeeze by and get, get out of that room. And there's a fundraiser held later that day on the same issue. All of this was a surprise to the rest of the victims in the case. They'd been given no warning that the court proceedings that day were going to involve the announcement that prosecutors will seek the death penalty. And all of this is coming on the heels of an executive order by California's new governor declaring a moratorium on executions. So meanwhile, some of the women who are raped are having a hard time grappling with why our current rape laws, which have no statute of limitations, don't apply to the attacks on them. The ability to, uh, to file criminal charges in their cases ended like three to five years after they were attacked, meaning that their rapists can no longer be charged with rape, no matter how much evidence there is. Chris McFarlane was 15 when she was raped in 1976. That's when California allowed judges to sentence rapists straight to probation. She still lives with the scars of the attack today. But the ability to file a criminal charge in her rape expired in 1979, three years after her attack. It's just, I don't know, I might be exaggerating, maybe it's too much to say, but it's, it's our own, it's our own laws re-victimizing us that it right. doesn't matter. It matters if it happened today, but it doesn't matter that it happened to me then. And that really does not make sense. There are no criminal charges pending in connection with Chris's rape, not even for kidnapping with robbery which is being charged in some of the other rapes. And again, that's another protection for the criminal. If you're saying, oh, they needed to know what the, what the um, consequences would be, we are again protecting the assailant, assailant not the victims. Yeah. It's just like, it's just fundamentally wrong. And I feel like it just doesn't make sense to me that we can't change that. One of the things that the project notes is that there were actually other serial rapists at the time. Um, they, they didn't get public attention like the East Area rapist, but they attacked as many or more women. Why, why is that? Now, that's a really good question. The, um, there were like six serial rapists active in Sacramento at the time as the East Area rapist. One of them, the early bird, had 42 victims, and there wasn't a single newspaper uh, story at the time. These women were being attacked in poorer neighborhoods. They were people of color, or they were women who were living alone in apartments. And so there's a suggestion that um, they invited their attack somehow or that they lived riskier lives. And when a rapist takes up in a middle-class, largely white suburb is the moment that everybody becomes hysterical and pays a lot of attention and starts screaming about it. I think second, too, I also saw a lot of political interest in um, covering up these crimes, lying to the public about what was happening, uh, even making claims that, like, women had left their doors unlocked, as in some way they're responsible for their attacks. And um, because we had sheriffs at that time who uh, were campaigning on the ability to you know, have a safe neighborhood, to keep neighborhoods safe. What do you think has not yet been talked about in this case? I think we have left the men out of the picture almost completely. We've not, uh, the, the 1970s kind of treated the, the role of a man as protecting a woman from attack. It, it dates back to our 4,000-year history of treating rape as a property crime. The person who's who's the victim actually in that case being the man. And so I think men, as they were bound and a gun held to their head uh, and forced to listen as their their wife or their girlfriend was drug off into another room to be raped, 
you know, they witnessed and experienced a huge amount of trauma, yet they were not treated as victims themselves. They were expected, in, in fact, they were blamed for letting this happen. They felt like it was their job and their duty to protect, you know, the woman and to not let this happen. And as a result of this afterward, most relationships, most of the couples broke up. They they couldn't find a way to to stay together. And and I'm now beginning to hear from the men and what they went through and uh, the incredible amount of silence that they have en- endured in this and and how that anger and rage is still inside them and still unresolved. Thank you so much, Paige, for talking with me about these issues today. It was it was really a great series. Thank you, Laura. We're going to continue to uh, follow the criminal proceedings and the impacts on the men and the women who were attacked and how they're dealing with it now uh, in, in the Los Angeles Times. There's a special site that the papers created, latimes.com slash man in the window, and it contains the crime maps, the old court reports and documents, old photos of Joe, Chris, Bonnie, uh, and even the media coverage at the time. And listeners might find that to be a really good armchair companion as they listen to the podcast. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is part seven of Man in the Window. We'd like to express our gratitude to the women willing to tell their stories and to the Center for Sacramento History. If you'd like us to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some offers from our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help us bring you our shows for free. And thank you. Man in the Window was written and reported by me, Paige St. John. Special episodes producer is Lee Hernandez. Associate producer is Casey Georgie. Original music by Allison Leighton Brown. Music coordinator is Marcelino Villalpando. Sound design by Spoke Media. Our editors at the Los Angeles Times are Steve Clow and Shelby Grad. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.